Welcome to the first chapter from your 12 lead ECG for acute care and critical care providers by Bob Page. We're going to be talking today chapter one and two, and I'm hoping that we're going to get a chance after our lecture to get some hands on time where you can play around and just, I want you to kind of screw around with the cardiac monitor, placing electrodes in different locations to see what it does for the different leads and the views. But really, we're going to talk predominantly about lead placement and acquisition. We talked about this last week, but it's just good information to keep, keep going over. We'll go over some objectives real quick. What we're getting into, I'm gonna advance my slide. There we go. Chapter one objectives, there's five, pardon me, four primary things we're gonna talk about in chapter one. We're gonna to learn to differentiate between bipolar and unipolar leads and precordial leads. We've kind of already done that. We'll also describe the lead placement for a 12 lead. We've done that as well too. And then we'll describe the procedure for 12 lead acquisition. And then the procedure for a multi-lead acquisition using a three lead bipolar EKG machine. Um, this is probably the, that last one is probably one of the more important ones that you'll see uh, because there are times when you're having a patient and all of a sudden your EMT partner is doing the old trauma naked. And next thing you know, they cut through your V leads. Well, you can still do a 12 lead if you use it in a three lead mode and move around uh, your uh, left leg lead. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We know that with electrodes, our limb leads, there's four primary that we see, our right arm, left arm, left leg, and right leg. Our right leg is gonna be more of a ground or neutral. And all of these leads have the ability to be bipolar, meaning what? They're bipolar, they can go both ways. They have the ability to be both positive and negative when it comes to polarity. And that's important when we talk about our uh, triangulation aspect or, or our uh, lead of, of interpretation. With bipolar leads, we have two electrodes, both positive and negative. It's the positive that actually looks towards the negative. So the positive lead looks towards the negative lead. And this is what establishes our three primary leads is one, two, and three for Eithoven's triangle. So again, on that multi-lead cheat sheet, you'll see that lead one is actually gonna go from the patient's left over to their upper right. It goes directly across the top of the heart. Once again, with lead two, we're gonna be looking at down from the bottom of our positive lead up to our top. Uh, in this case, it's gonna be our upper right. And then for lead three, it's gonna look in the other angle here from the bottom up. And it's actually looking backwards in, in time, if you will. It's almost like a camera's turned around and taking a picture at it to see what the heart is doing. If the heart's electrical conduction system is traveling towards the positive lead or traveling towards the camera, we should see a positive spike from the isoelectric line. If it's traveling, if the electrical conduction system is traveling away from the positive lead or away from the camera, you would see what on the EKG? From the isometric line, you would see a positive or negative deflection. Negative deflection, very good, okay. Now there are those augmented leads, right? These augmented leads are going to be where you're going to see where they're going to go on the chest, AVR, AVL, and AVF. In essence, this allows for three additional views to look up from the center of the chest up to the right. That's AVR. We're going to be looking up into the left for AVL and down to the front. Again, the electrical conduction system, if it travels towards a positive lead, in this case, traveling towards a positive lead, it would have a positive upright complex. And then these diagrams, you'll notice that where the heart is, if we know, if we kind of overlay where our conduction system is, the signal will start from the top of the heart and work its way down towards the apex. Normal healthy heart would look something along like this, where it's moving from the top to the bottom. This is why in a normal heart, I should see positive, um, uh, or not elevation, but positive deflection in lead AVF, right? Most of the leads we looked at 12 leads earlier showed a positive AVF. AVR, AVR, it's actually traveling to away from uh, the positive electrode. So I would probably see a negative deflection in AVR. Uh, and then AVL, again, I'm going to be traveling more towards than away. We're going to start to use some of these complexes or these deflections to determine if there's blocks within the conduction system, specifically within the, the bundle branches. Or pardon me, actually, the hemi branches. Precordial leads, now we're talking about unipolar. These only look one way. They look in. With your precordial or your um, limb leads, Right, those are going to be more of on a, a vertical axis. Right, they look 
on that vertical axis. The chordial leads look at a horizontal axis and actually look directly into the chest. There's V1 through V6. We talked about placement already. And again, we know that it's based on anatomical landmarks. Here again, you can get an idea of where we're at. Your clavicle is to represent where your rib one would be. Uh, you're gonna have rib two, rib three, rib four, right? So where the fourth intercostal space is just located below the fourth rib. We're gonna put one on the patient's right side and then one on the left of the sternum. We're gonna go ahead and skip uh, V3 and go to V4. V4 should go uh, in our fifth intercostal space, just below our fifth rib, midclavicular line. And then directly between V3 and V2, or probably V4 and V2 should be V3. We wanna make sure that they're equally spaced. And then we're gonna skip five and go to six. Six will go on the apex, I'm sorry, sorry the apex, the uh, lateral aspect. Take their arm back, have them kind of make a chicken wing. That'll expose the lateral aspect of the chest. Fifth intercostal space, a mid axillary line. I'm gonna place that there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and place in between four and six, V5, making four, five, and six in a relatively straight line. And again, when you see these, you notice that they're mostly looking through the intercostal space, right? They wanna be able to do that because we don't wanna to have to look through the ribs. Another way of taking a look at it for a patient who's sitting down, kind of give you an idea of anatomical landmarks, uh, nipple line, uh, center of chest, you're gonna see that these are gonna be relatively consistent. Uh, above your nipples, but just it depends on your an anatomy, right? Uh, you get some a uh, patient who's very heavy, or a female who's or male who's has uh, has a large chest. Those could be aspects that you're going to have to anticipate. I can't take and put an electrode over someone's breast because I I need it to be down here. I'm going to have to lift that breast up and be able to place it directly on the thoracic cavity where it goes. Right, so it's not like I'm going to be placing them over breast tissue. We know that we want to make sure the skin is prepped. That's important for these electrodes to stick. Dry and wet skin cause some issues, right? Excessively dry skin or excessively moist skin, either way can cause problems. Dry them off if you need to. Use those red dots or an alcohol prep pad to clean any loose or skin away or any dirt. Um, and that's going to be then part of that uh, shaving or clipping their chest hair. We want to recognize what good quality is versus poor quality. Poor quality generally has to do with uh, poor preparation of the skin or excessive patient movement. It may also have to do where um, the uh, limb leads are too proximal on the limbs or too far to the wrist, right? They can be just off the shoulder. That's a lot less movement than putting it on somebody's wrist if they have a uh, Parkinson's disease. The other thing that we're going to look for um, is oftentimes the 12 lead, it'll pop up and tell you too much artifact and it won't generate a printout for you. You have to override it and say, yes, give it to me. When I override that force to print, it's not going to be an accurate reading of, from what the computer algorithm is going to tell me. That binary algorithm is normally not accurate anyways, but in this case, it's definitely not going to be. And if I need to, especially if someone has Parkinson's, you know, all you have to do is, let me see your wrist here, Mr. Brent, uh, both hands here, right? Kind of give me a pretend shake like you got Parkinson's, very good. If I just put a little bit of general traction on his arms, the trimmers will stop. Okay, if there's a little bit of traction on those muscles, will make a big difference. And that's something you can do if you have a patient who has uh, Parkinson's. Now, a standard three or four lead monitor, right? Oftentimes you're gonna use or hear the term modified chest lead. This is common in the hospital uh, where you'll have an MCL lead, right? Uh, that modified chest lead in essence is the same thing as a V lead, right? Or a vector lead. In these cases, uh, it's just a different name because it's a different type of uh, wire. It's not part of a all the precordial leads. Um, they do offer some advantages for monitoring, especially in lead two. What's some of the benefits of monitoring in lead two? There's only a couple that you can think of. Tells us rate, heart rate, too fast, too slow. And what's the other thing? Potentially for AV blocks. There's one more. Part of its regular uh, arrhythmias. So like life-threatening arrhythmias, V-fib, asystole those types of things. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of benefit to it lead to other than, you know, I'm monitoring heart rate in a trauma patient. That's an okay way of using the cardiac monitor. I got a patient who's got a pulse and a problem between nose and navel. I probably should be monitoring more closely with additional leads. Now here's how this kind of works, right? So let's say scenario-based, you're gonna get a multi-lead EKG, okay?
Okay, you're going to run your prime, and you're using a monitor that's either a really old monitor, right? Or you lost your precordial leads, or your partner cut them. That's the best one yet. Okay, so now you got a patient who's got a 12 lead, and you just cut your leads. What are you going to do? Well, now we have a way that you can actually make this work. First thing you're going to do is you're going to run leads one, two, and three on your monitor because we know those are controlled by the limb leads. It's not a big deal. From there, I'm going to leave the monitor in lead three. Okay, this is a critical portion of it. I then can take my left leg or my red electrodes and I can move it. It's kind of blocked here on the screen, but I can move it to the V1 position. And that's what you're seeing here, right? So I have my white over here on my right. I've got my black on my left. And normally our, my left leg would be way down here on his leg, right? But I'm going to move that up and I'm going to place it fourth intercostal space, uh, going to be just left, probably just right of, of the sternum. And then I'm going to run that strip in lead three. I'm going to print it out and I'm going to write on the strip, cross out lead three and write MCL1 because I modified a chest lead to do an EKG. So now I got V1. What do you think I need to do when I want V2? Move, yep, unhook my, uh, put a new electrode in, unhook my wire, hook it back up, run a strip again. Again in lead three. Now I'm running a situation where I can get every single lead as I progress on from V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I can move those in succession. What you will find is that if you run a strip like that, and then you run a regular 12 lead, the printouts will look different. And we're going to experiment with that here in a little bit. Okay. This is an example of a nine lead EKG. You can't really get a 12 lead with only three electrodes. Okay. Your regular life packs have four wires, right? R A L A L L and RL, right leg. That right leg is that ground, which gives you the augmented ease. So if I go back a little bit, this monitor here, which is actually a life pack 11 or life pack 10, uh, does not always have that capability to do a 12 lead. So you wouldn't have uh, necessarily that right leg lead to give you those augmented views. Hence the reason why you would only have nine. But because we're saying, hey, somebody lost our precordial leads or somebody cut those, we can do this. If you cut one of your four leads, wires, then it won't work. You're just not going to have a monitor. You got to have all four in order for it to show up on your life pack. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you wait till you get a firefighter that's excited or your partner is excited and you're like, take a shirt off, cut a shirt off. Oh, yeah, they pulled their raptor scissors out the first time they've ever used them since they had lunch opening a bag of chips. And they cut all that up and they go crazy. Next thing you know, the monitor goes, dee, 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 dee. and you're like, why did I lose electrodes? Because somebody cut it. So now let's start talking about the printout. Okay, we're, we're laying a heavy foundation for you. Quite a few more objectives. Number one, we talked about locating the unipolar, bipolar, and precordial leads on a printout. We've been able to do that so far. We were going to talk more about how do you find measurement information, right? We've done a lot of looking at J points and things and identifying uh, elevation, but we got to make sure we get some additional um, numerical uh, measurement value. We'll talk about the benefits and the limitations of the machine analysis. We know that it's a binary system, so is it very accurate? No, it's not very accurate when it comes to interpretation. Uh, and then we'll talk about how do you convert seconds to milliseconds, because that's important, because the printout will always be in milliseconds. We're used to dealing with seconds. And then we'll be able to locate where the isoelectric line is for calibration uh, as a reference. That's not very complicated, is it? Here it is, standard hospital printout. Normal sinus rhythm, ST elevation, consider anterior or lateral injury or acute infarct. ST elevation, consider inferior injury or acute infarct. Acute MI, abnormal EKG. Y'all agree that's an inferior? So what leads would you see for uh, an inferior MI? 2-3 AVF? 2-3 AVF. Really kind of hard to see, isn't it? So one of the things that's important to point out here is the standard hospital printout, number one, is going to provide you with the same stuff we always get, but then you're also going to have additional leads, V2, lead two, and V5. Sometimes you'll see V1 in, addition, in replace of V2. But that's going to be where you're going to go through and you're going to have a whole bunch of aspects of, of additional information that the hospital has. The other part I want to point to you here is the top where we have all of this information. Too many paramedics, too many physicians when that printout comes hot off the paper, they pull it open, they don't look at any of the squiggly lines, but they go right up here to this aspect. And what's the first thing it says in the top? Normal sinus. No. This thing here? 
Yep. You're good. Yep. You're good. So, but at any rate, this is exact kind of an idea of what it would look like. There's a lot of information on here. You have the printout. I'm not a big fan of using this. Now, I know the hospitals require you to have this where it says, you know, acute MI or whatever the new print star, 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 whatever it might be. Right. They want to see that, but that's, do you know why they make us do that? Because we can't read EKGs and we have excessively activated the cath lab for false STEMIs. Okay. We just, we got to be careful. We got to recognize that you know, we're not good at reading these because we don't give it enough time typically. Um, we also know there's a lot of numerical data here. Ventricular rate, 84 beats a minute. PR interval, no more are we going to be counting out the number of small boxes. 156 milliseconds. Anybody know how many seconds that is? Nope. 0 0.156 or 0.15 or 0.16 if you round up, right? So we're used to using 0.12 to 0.20, right? Well, now we're just going to be able to look and say, okay, 0.12 is 120, right? And 0.20 is 200. So is the PR, is the PR with a normal, uh, normal range? Yes. That's the conversion of milliseconds uh, and seconds. QRS duration. No longer do we have to measure if it's wide or narrow. We're going to be able to use this information to say if it's wide or narrow. If it's greater than 120 milliseconds or greater than 0.12 seconds, it is considered wide, right? most likely coming from the ventricles or because of some type of conduction block. QT segments. The QT segment's gonna let me know how long between Q and T waves. The longer and longer and longer that gets, the more likelihood or the more likely my patient will end up in some type of a ventricular arrhythmia. And then we will talk about the almighty wheel of axis. Oh. And we're gonna look at things like the R axis, 17. That's gonna tell us where on the wheel of axis that falls. So if 17 is the degree of the axis, does that fall within the normal range? It does, right? So there's some aspects and things that we can use that data for. I want you to use the data that's available to you to make good, fast, accurate decisions. We're also going to learn how to interpret waveforms a lot, but I will tell you a lot of the information you can get about what you would interpret and lead to can easily be interpreted just by looking at some numer numerical values, okay? We know the data happens in four columns, like I talked to you before in our previous lesson. It's gonna capture them one, then two, then three, and then four. We know that the extra leads in the bottom are gonna also be captured as well too, and those are all in real time. So it snaps it and it continuously monitors those leads. It's not just a single snapshot, but it's more of a continuous lead. The content for analysis. We have to be very systematic in the way that you approach your interpretation. We know that the analysis is gonna start with a lot of numerical values and then a basically kind of flowing through uh, your ICEL and some other aspects, hemi blocks, bundle branches, will walk you through some of that process that you can see. But the content of analysis really should start with that numerical value, right? When I look at the PRI and I see that it's a 0 .1, or, uh, 0 0.166 or 0 0.17 seconds, right? Is that normal or abnormal? 0.12 to 0.20 is normal PRI. This is in seconds, mind you, not milliseconds. Nope, normal. 0.12 to 0.20. Does it go greater than 0.2? Nope. QRS, uh, less than 0.12. Is that less than 0.12? Yeah, normal, right? Uh, QRS, axis is negative 42. I'm going QRS axis, so I'm looking for here. No, that is not normal, but that should be an example of negative 42 would be an example of a physiological left axis deviation, pathological left axis deviation, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I know some stuff. But those are all things that are important, right? But in order to make that valuable, I've got to be able to convert seconds to milliseconds or milliseconds to seconds. It's more pre prevalent. We learned how to measure in seconds. Your, your monitors are almost all defaulted to milliseconds. So here's an example of where we're dealing with seconds. You can see that 0.16 seconds, this would equate to 166 milliseconds, okay? So I'm going to one, two, three places over. That's going to let me know that I moved it from the, uh, from the tenths to the hundredth place. Machine analysis. I love this. This is legitimately an actual rundown. Normal sinus rhythm, left anterior fascicle block, Minimal voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, maybe normal variant, nonspecific ST and T wave abnormality, abnormal EKG. 
Does that tell you anything? Or does that just sound complicated? It's very complicated, why? Because the machine analyzes data for a conclusion. It's all based on what does the binary system tell us? It has to be yes, it has to be no. It can't be, I'm not sure, move on to something else. We can use that type of interpretation uh, technique, but the machine cannot. The machine analyzes the data. People interpret the rhythm, okay? You are responsible to read this. And we know that too many times it's gonna give you, you know, uh, er erroneous readings where you're gonna see like uh, inferior myocardial infarction and possible lateral infarct. Can you have an inferior and a lateral infarct at the same time? Probably not, not unless they're having some major un underlying issue, right? And we know that acute care providers must be able to tell the difference between a false abnormal, a false uh, readout and an actual uh, problem that you might interpret on the ECG. Isoelectric line, we've talked about finding the J point, right? And identifying where that is. When you do a 12 lead, Maddie's got her 12 lead here. Why don't you pull that out and take a look at it? You can share with the class. But if you take a look here, the first thing you're gonna see um, is this basis uh, for all voltage measurements. The isoelectric line is gonna be the basis for that, right? And you're gonna find that the machine is gonna go and it's gonna fire up and it's gonna activate, it's gonna hit a flat line, it's gonna drop back down. Where it drops back down to, that makes that box, almost looks like a capnography uh, waveform, that's gonna determine the beginning of the isoelectric line. Most of the time it's relatively accurate. It does depend on if your leads are properly placed, but we can kind of get an idea where uh, approximately the isoelectric line would be from that. It's usually found at the bottom of the calibration bar, and that's what this is, okay? Other things that can affect the, the ability for you to get a good isoelectric line could be examples of ST uh, elevation or depression with that J point moving. And then you may also see issues with things like hypertrophy or an, a thickening of the, of the ventricles that could cause that problem as well too. So you kind of see here, the bottoms out, bottoms out, bottoms out. That's gonna be the example of that calibration bar, that, that boxy stuff you see in the beginning. Now, we also have to validate your 12 lead, right? So one of the things that we should do to validate our 12 lead is to make sure our our leads are properly placed. So limb leads should go on the limbs. It's pretty simple, right? Uh, in lead one, generally, if it's properly placed, the P wave, Q or S and T wave should be upside down in lead one. AVR is another one that you would see that's generally globally negative, okay? That's the one I like to say, is, is, is AVR globally negative? What do I mean by globally negative? Here's an example of globally negative, right? So this is, Improper lead placement, this is considered proper lead placement. See how my P wave is upside down? See how my QRS is upside down? See how my T wave is upside down? It's all globally negative. And if you were to look, flip your charts over, your, your multi-lead cheat sheets, and if you take a look here uh, where you're gonna be dealing with AVR, you see how AVR is blued out? AVR is where the aorta sits, okay? So it's not a lead we're gonna to use to determine any specific MI location. But if for some reason AVR is positive, either I've got my limb leads on wrong, which is probably, probably the case, or I've got some type of issue where my leads are running correctly, okay? Um, so typically you'll see that. Oftentimes uh, with, v, with lead one, if it's upside down, it's because you've got the black on the wrong side and the white lead on the wrong side as well too. So you just got a flip flop around. Yep, remember white on the right, smoke over the fire, grass grows below on the other side for the green. Now, remember we talked about uh, valid 12 lead and we talked about R wave progression, right? It won't be so bad. R wave progression. See how I got an R wave here? See how it gets taller? Taller, 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 taller. About five, four, five, six, sometimes level out because it's a straight line. But you see how it gets progressively taller, especially for V1 through V4. That lets you know that you've got good precordial lead placement. Okay, here's an example of poor. I have an R wave, right? Look how high it got. Then it got a little bit slower, lower, lower, higher, lower, right? That lets me know that my leads are not properly placed. Take an ER12 lead, next transfer you get, and see if the R wave uh, location plots out. I have watched some text in the ER, slap stickers right over someone's breast, uh, not properly located on the arms, not properly placed anywhere. 
you know, they're doing V leads either uh, like V1 and 2 are up by our ne uh, their neck or V1 and 2 are down by the belly button, right? They don't, they just thra slap it on to get the quick reading. Validate it. Validating ensures your interpretation is the, or the machine's interpretation is going to be correct. It's going to prevent that augmentation. So we got 15 minutes left of class. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to go and we're going to, we got a life pack back there in the back. We can go grab another life pack from upstairs if we need to. And I want you to get the electrodes out of there and I want you to start putting electrodes on there, right? Put just lead two, but put them wherever you want on one person. Take and do a regular 12 lead on somebody else. Take the uh, regular four lead and do the modified chest lead V1 through six and get those and see how they compare to a regular 12 lead, okay? And then once we've done that, we'll move on to pharmacology for the day. <laughs> we, did, we did have a case one time where uh, 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 my old boss came in and he, was, he said, I'm, I'm having some chest pain. And I was like, oh, really? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, so have a seat. Uh, we'll do a 12 lead. And I uh, had all my students with me and we were in the 12 lead. It was normal. But I pointed out, and we hadn't covered a lot in 12 lead yet. And I pointed out to one of the students, I said, oh my God, do you see this? Well, he's got a bundle branch block and a hemi block. And are, like, are you feeling okay? Are you, are you doing all right, man? He's like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it really is hurting. And then the students started to go like, oh yeah, oh yeah. They, they were just making it up with me or buying in. Luckily, he wasn't having a heart attack. It was normal, but it was really funny. So for us, not, not for him. Um, any questions, though? Going once, going twice. All right. We're going to build off this next week. So stay tuned.